synovial joints are perhaps the most important kind of joints in the body and in some ways some of the more easily damaged joints because they are weight bearing joints. So let's spend a little bit of time here talking about synovial joints and here's just a generalized or generic synovial joint and what we'll find is like all joints a bone on each side coming together and then in the synovial joint here we're going to have a joint cavity and this is where we start getting some unique characteristics of synovial joints compared to other types of joints these joint cavities are going to contain synovial fluid and synovial fluid really is a lubricating fluid that helps to ensure that joint moves more smoothly with less friction and so it's a more comfortably moving joint and that's important because these again are weight bearing joints typically or are going to experience some degree of pressure and perhaps a lot of movement so lubrication is a good thing there's going to be the synovial membrane the green tissue around the edges of the synovial cavity or the joint cavity and this is where the synovial fluid comes from and it's sort of like your car when your car is sitting not running for a period of time the oil settles out of the engine down into the oil pan at the bottom because it's not being used it doesn't need to be kept up in the engine and when you first start the car the oil is still in the oil pan so the engine for a very short period of time is unlubricated the same sort of thing happens with synovial joints the synovial membrane absorbs that fluid if it's not being used and then when you go to use it you have a temporarily unlubricated joint which will hopefully quickly lubricate again as the synovial membrane releases that fluid back out perhaps you notice if you've been sitting for a long period of time and you get up to move around you might feel a little bit stiff in the joints but fairly quickly that would loosen up and this is really common in older folks and what's happening is they would get up they'd be quite stiff but it seems like after they've moved around for a couple of minutes they would loosen up and get going because that synovial membrane was getting the synovial fluid back into the joint and lubricating it so it was temporarily dry and it wasn't working very smoothly but as that synovial fluid re-enters the joint things smooth up the older you get typically the more pronounced that sort of response would be it's working but it's just taking longer for the synovial membrane to get the synovial fluid released typically that joint cavity is going to be surrounded by a fibrous layer so a relatively tough connective tissue wrapping around and forming that capsule to keep it hopefully intact let's look at some other features that we often find with these joints and that is the presence of perhaps a tendon sheath or a bursa a tendon sheath as labeled here is basically a synovial membrane containing synovial fluid that is wrapped around a tendon and a tendon is a connection between a muscle and a bone so here is an example on the shoulder and that particular tendon of the biceps brachii so the biceps muscle that muscle builders are so proud of is going to be moving a lot as that muscle contracts and relaxes and the tendon sheath is there to cushion to help to lubricate that movement back and forth so that in its large amount of movement that it does it is hopefully protected perhaps you've heard of tendonitis before and that's when the tendon and the tendon sheath actually are irritating each other so the tendon sheath is not adequately cushioning lubricating protecting the tendon and it's becoming irritated and swollen and basically that just means you've overused it so give it a rest probably a couple of weeks of rest and most of those sorts of problems will greatly improve a bursa we can see one here at the top and let's go ahead and look at that a little closer here is a small bag of synovial membrane with synovial fluid inside in between typically a bone and a perhaps a tendon or a ligament or something like that that would perhaps otherwise be rubbing on the bone and as that bone moves back and forth this little bursa rolls back and forth 
with the bone and provides that cushioning so it's a rolling lubricated mat in between the bone and something uh, around it. We'll see these bursa scattered throughout in critical locations um, throughout the body and we'll get to some of those examples here in a little bit. Synovial joints allow all kinds of different movements and so some of the movements that we can do with a synovial joint are gliding movements and that's going to happen at the wrist think about the beauty queen wave that's a gliding movement so the carpals of the wrist uh, sort of slide back and forth on each other so it's a relatively small type of synovial joint there in flexion and extension you can flex or extend most parts of your body. Flexion is making the angle between the two body parts smaller. Extension is making the angle between those two body parts larger. So in the case of the head, flexion would be going from, remember this is always from the perspective of anatomical position. So standing upright, feet together pointed forwards, arms down to the side, palms facing forward head straight up. So if the head's straight up, it's in an extended position. To flex it, your chin would drop down towards the sternum. To extend, you'd bring it back up into the upright position. To hyperextend, you would lean the head back beyond the fully upright position. You can flex and extend at the waist. So flexing at the waist is bending forward, so your head is pointing more towards your feet. Extending is getting you back upright again, and hyperextension, leaning backwards. So hyperextension basically takes you past normal anatomical position. We can flex and extend the arms at the shoulder. So flexion in this case would be lifting the arms up towards the head. Extension would be bringing the arms back down and more towards the anatomical position, hyperextension of arms would be bringing them behind the body. The leg would work the same way, extension moving the leg forward, flexion moving the leg backwards. You can flex and extend at the elbows, so to flex at the elbows is to make the muscle man muscle pose. To extend is, as the name would suggest, extend or open the arm back out to a fully extended limb. The same sort of thing at the knee. Flexion is bringing the foot towards the back side of the body. Extension, bringing it back to anatomical position to the front. The arms can circumduct. So circumduction is rotating the arms through the shoulder in a circular method. Think of perhaps flying with your arms like uh, rotating it like a bird perhaps would flap its wings a little bit would be circumduction. To abduct, so ab with a B as in boy, abduct the arms means to move them away from the core of the body, so more out to the sides. Adduct with a D brings the arms back in towards the body. So I've always considered the difference in adduction is adding the arms back to the core of the body. Abduction would be subtracting from the core of the body. And thinking of add and adduction, adding to the core of the body, has always helped me keep it straight. So if that works for you, great. If not, just memorize the difference. We can rotate the body a number of different ways. Obviously at the head you would have rotation that goes left and right. And the legs can also rotate left and right. So lateral rotation moves the legs such in a lateral direction that the toes, instead of pointing forwards, are now pointing out to the side. So the toys are the toes rather, sorry, are pointed laterally out to the side from the body. That's lateral rotation. Medial rotation is moving the legs such that the toes move in a medial direction, that is, getting back into anatomical position. Some very specialized movements that only happen in certain parts of the body here. 
in the lower arms we can have pronation and supination. Pronation is the rotation of the lower arm at the elbow. So if you start in anatomical position, that's palms forward, thumbs pointed out to the sides, and you rotate such that the thumb moves from pointing laterally to pointing medially, that means now instead of palms to the front, now palms are down or to the back. And what has happened in the lower arm is something very interesting. When you were in anatomical position, the radius and the ulna were parallel to each other. When you pronated, so the thumb went from lateral to medial rotation here, the radius is always going to follow the thumb. So wherever the thumb goes, the radius goes to. If the thumb traded places from left to right, that means the radius did too. At the elbow, the radius doesn't really change its location, but it did rotate over the ulna, forming more of an X shape as you pronated. And that's really useful because this stiffens the lower arm and provides an ability to transfer more force through the lower arm to the hands. If you want to push something very heavy, you're not going to walk up to it and put your in a anatomical position and push with your palms having the radius and ulna parallel to each other. That's just not very much of a forceful movement. So you would pronate, then push, and that helps to stiffen the lower arm and transfer energy more efficiently from the body out through the hands to the object you're trying to work on. To supinate means to bring the hands back into anatomical position or to, I guess, keep them there. So historically, pronation would be a submissive pose. To pronate yourself before someone would be to, let's say, bow to a king. You're going to pronate the arms, palms down on the ground, and that's basically admitting superiority of the other party. Supination is a begging position. Hands out, palms up, hoping for something. So in a way, it is a submissive position as well, but it's a submissive asking position. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occur with the foot. Plantar flexion occurs when the toes point farther away from the body. Dorsiflexion occurs when the toes point more back towards the body. So if... You want to think of it this way. Plantar flexion occurs when you plant the foot and push off. So think of standing on your toes would be a plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion would be trying to stand on your heels. At the foot, you can invert and evert. So inversion of the foot occurs when you rotate the foot such that the big toe comes up. Eversion is big toe going down, little toe coming up. Protraction and retraction occur with the jaw. Protraction is to protrude the jaw. So the lower jaw would protrude forward past its normal resting alignment with the upper jaw. Retraction is going to be pulling that lower jaw back, either back into position or actually back slightly behind where it would normally sit in alignment with the upper jaw. Elevation and depression also occurs with the jaw. To elevate the jaw means really to close the mouth. To depress the jaw means to relax the muscles of the face and allow the lower jaw to open. So opening and closing your mouth. Think about chewing food. Think about talking. Anytime you're using, you're moving your upper, and, or rather your lower jaw up and down, you are elevating and depressing. Our last special characteristic here is opposition. An opposition is the ability to oppose your thumb to any of the other four fingers tip to tip. Opposable thumbs is what makes us as a high level primate different from all the other lower level organisms is the opposable thumb concept. So the tip of your thumb can directly touch the tip of any other finger on your hand without using anything other than those two fingers themselves to get there. Low-level primates and other vertebrates don't have opposable thumbs.
And having this opposition ability allows our hands to be so much more versatile and useful than they would be if you couldn't oppose. So if you could move your thumb but couldn't actually touch the tip of your other fingers, gripping and other fine manipulations you're able to do with your hands would not be possible. Let's take a look at some specific synovial joints. And as we're looking at these joints, we want to ask ourselves, what is it that restricts the range of motion of this joint and determines its movement abilities? And it can be shape of the bone. It can be ligaments and tendons. Or it could be muscle. So those three things really are going to determine what range of motion a joint has and what determines what that joint is capable of doing and supporting. So if we look here at the knee joint, the knee is a very crucial joint of the body because it is carrying most of the weight of the body. And if we look here at the lower femur at the top and the upper tibia at the bottom here, those are the two bones involved in this joint. And we can see that the femur has what are labeled here as condyles, a lateral and medial condyle, is the end of the femur articulating or involving in the knee joint here. So it has some bone shape to it, but it's not a significant shape. And the tibia has very little shape to the top of it, meaning that shape of bones does not significantly regulate or get involved in the joint's function here. It would be nice if it did because that would provide a much sturdier joint for the knee bearing all that weight, but that's just not how it works. Because the tibia has very shallow depressions for the femur to sit in, there is a mass of tissue here called the meniscus. And there's a lateral and medial meniscus and basically its job is to obviously help cushion the impact these two bones would have on each other, but also to somewhat deepen the socket that the femur sits in. Now it's still not a deep socket, but any improvement in depth of the socket here will provide some benefit and stability. The problem with the meniscus, and we'll see a picture of this later on, is that it's really only attached to the tibia at the front edge. So it's not firmly attached to the tibia, which means it's easily torn. And we'll get to a torn meniscus later on, but that can be a real problem. So we're determined here that bone shape really didn't do a whole lot towards stability and movement of this joint. So that leaves us ligamus tendons and muscle. So let's see what else we've got here. We have ligaments. We have an anterior and a posterior cruciate ligament here in the middle of this knee joint. The anterior cruciate ligament is perhaps one of the most famous ligaments in the body, commonly referred to as the ACL. And the ACL runs from the back side of the femur to the front side of the tibia. So that's helping to anchor the femur and tibia joint in a front to back direction. The posterior cruciate ligament runs from the back of the tibia towards the front of the femur. It's also helping to stabilize in the front and back direction. So ACL is running one direction, PCL is running the opposite direction, and that helps to restrict how much the femur and tibia can move back and forth on each other in a front to back direction. We also have some collateral ligaments, so a fibular collateral ligament and a tibial collateral ligament over here on the sides. The fibular collateral ligament comes down to the fibula, the tibial collateral ligament comes down to the tibia, and that's helping to anchor this joint left to right. So it's strapping down on the left side and on the right side, helping to keep the femur and the tibia from moving very much in a left to right direction. Obviously, having these ligaments be the primary stabilizing factor of the joint, it does allow those bones to move back and forth on each other a little bit, but roughly it holds it in place. Also, we're going to have here the patellar ligament 
in the quadriceps tendon, which attach to the patella here in the middle, or the kneecap, and that's going to help strap the femur and tibia together on the front side and provide a little bit of a shielding protection to all of these ligaments and menisci and things like that inside. So a little bit of stability and a little bit of protection. If we look at the knee from the side there, we can see the ACL and PCL in their place. And we also see in the front side of the knee joint here, cerebral bursa. Remember the bursa were the rolling bags of synovial fluid. So there's a deep infrapatellar bursa. So underneath the uh, patellar ligament is a bursa. In front of the kneecap or patella is a bursa. And then underneath the quadriceps tendon is a bursa. So all three of those sections there have that cushioning pad in place. You don't see any bursa on the backside. And that's because you don't crawl around on the back side of your knee. You don't need cushion on the back side of your knee, but you do need it a lot on the front side where there's a lot of stuff moving around. There's not nearly as much movement on the back side of the knee in terms of muscles and other pressures. So the front side is where the support and the cushioning needs to occur. There's also typically a little bit of a fat pad there on the front side of the knee as well. And that helps to provide some extra cushioning for that joint. Before we move on, I should say one other thing about bursa. Just like with the tendon sheath, if it becomes overused, it becomes swollen and becomes tendonitis. If a bursa is overused, it becomes swollen and irritated, very painful, and is called bursitis. Again, the treatment is rest, allow it to recover, and whatever you were doing in the first place, well, stop doing it. Most of you wouldn't know me if you met me on the street because you've not seen me in person yet. But several years ago, I caused myself to have bursitis. And I have never been an anorexic individual. But um, I was on my knees for a couple of days working on building a little stone retaining wall around the back side of the pool that we had at that time. And basically overused those little cushioning pads. And to this day, so now about probably 10 years later, my knees are still fairly delicate because of the damage that incurred in that couple of days. So I have learned if I'm going to be on my knees for more than a few seconds, I need to have knee pads. And not just any knee pad will do the trick. So I have to buy the rather expensive gel-filled knee pads. They're very nice and comfortable, but they're also about 35 to 40 dollars a pair and um, that helps to provide that extra cushion because of the damage that I incurred on that knee so basically that knee pad is designed to sort of act like a bursa provide that gel fle flexible cushioning there so that the rest of the knee itself doesn't suffer that impact and that hard edge surface If we look down at the top of the tibia, here we see the meniscus and get a little bit better appreciation for it and where all of these things are attaching. So we can see the ACL and PCL attachment points there and then the menisci on each side in the middle. And again, the meniscus is only attached around the edges, so it's relatively easy for that to tear off. But this does provide a little bit deeper socket for the femur to rest in. If we go ahead and put all the muscles in place that would be associated with the knee here, we see that uh, the muscle doesn't really encase the knee itself. So the knee is directly behind the patella here, and we can see the fibular and tibial collateral ligaments. Uh, there's a little bit uh, more, uh, in this case, tendon coming down with the uh, medial and lateral patellar retinaculum. Uh, but for the most part, the ligaments we've already discussed really was what was holding that together. So we would say muscle doesn't have a significant role in the knee. If we look at the backside, we've just got more uh, pieces of these ligaments and tendons visible here. 
and just more of the casing that wraps around to seal the synovial joint in place. Because of all of the body's weight sitting on the knees and because of these relatively seemingly inadequate structures of ligaments holding it together, the knee is an easily damaged joint of the body. So what would happen here if we have this hockey puck or any kind of high speed, high pressure impact? Wouldn't have to be that. Could also be, let's say, playing football and happening to be tackled and your knee gets twisted at the wrong angle. But in this case, the hockey puck comes in and impacts the lateral side of the knee. Now it's going to bruise the fibular collateral ligament here where it impacts. It's then going to cause the knee joint to pull apart. So pressure on this lateral side, stretching pressure on the medial side, which would then perhaps tear the tibial collateral ligament because that's attached to the meniscus, it might tear the medial meniscus and probably tear the anterior cruciate ligament. This is called the unhappy triad because three of the big pieces of this knee just got torn all the pieces. If the impact had occurred medially rather than laterally, the reverse would have occurred. The tibial collateral ligament would have been bruised, the lateral meniscus would have been torn, and the fibular collateral ligament would have been torn. Now in all this, the posterior cruciate ligament has the possibility of being torn in this process as well, but it's a little bit longer and uh, doesn't seem to mind as much some of these kinds of impacts. This is going to be a major reconstructive surgery here to try to put all these things back together. And here's the problem with ligaments, with menisci, with things like that. They are poorly vascularized. So that means they don't have a really good blood supply. And while they are comprised of living tissues, when that tissue doesn't have a good blood supply, it doesn't repair itself quickly because everything moves slowly when you're short on uh, blood supply. And it perhaps won't do a complete job of repairing itself. So reconstructive surgery on this would be to sew it back together, try to tack it all back in place, and give it a long time to heal. But after you tear these sorts of things, they are always going to be a little bit more delicate and probably put you at greater risk of tearing it again. If we look at the shoulder, the shoulder is not nearly as much of a weight-bearing joint, so we don't have to worry quite as much about sturdiness here. But we have the humerus coming up and interacting with the scapula, the shoulder bone. If we look here, we have some ligaments that are strapping the humerus onto the scapula. Basically, not to give it a great deal of structural stability, but simply to keep the arm from falling off. And that sounds kind of silly, but literally, these ligaments are there to keep the humerus from significantly detaching away from the scapula, but not really going to give it any sort of stability or um, significant support. If we think about the shape of the bones, the ball of the humerus and the socket of the scapula are very insignificant. It's a small humerus ball. It's a small, shallow scapular socket. So shape of the bone here really isn't providing significant interaction support either. Just like we saw with the knee and the meniscus trying to provide a little bit better place for the femur to sit, the glenoid labrum is going to be an extension of cartilage and that sort of thing, making the socket of the scapula a little deeper, a little better for the humerus to sit in. Again, it's not significant, but any kind of improvement certainly helps here. So if bone shape wasn't a significant stabilizing factor, ligaments were just there to hold it together, not necessarily to stabilize it, that leaves us with muscle. So muscle is the primary force holding the shoulder together, uh, providing directional control, providing support for the shoulder. And we see here the rotator cuff muscles. And most of those have been cut off for this particular view. 
but that's going to be significant in providing the structural support and movement of the shoulder. And you've perhaps heard of people damaging their rotator cuff before, and the recovery process for that is usually about a six-month rehab period. I'm told it's very painful. I can imagine that because you still have to move this joint, but the muscles in that case, along with perhaps some tendons and other things, got damaged. So the recovery process is going to be relatively slow, and you must move that joint a lot in the rehab process. So that's going to provide pain in the experience. But if you don't go through the rehab properly, that joint will freeze up, and you may never have any kind of reasonable range of motion again. About 20 years ago now, I damaged my rotator cuff muscles in my right shoulder. I did not go to the doctor for it. I just limped through the rest of that year with some pain, some discomfort, and a little bit of loss of range of motion. Uh, for the most part, uh, it seems to have healed somewhat, but to this day, if I throw a ball the wrong way with the wrong twist or the wrong jerking motion of the shoulder, it can cause some excruciating pain. If I rotate the shoulder even slowly in the wrong direction sometimes, it can be quite sore and painful. So that's 20 years later. So if I had gone to the doctor, perhaps they would have put things back together properly, and I probably would have a greater functionality of my shoulder. I still have a full range of motion, but again, certain movements at certain speeds can be painful. So I don't do a lot of throwing balls and things like that anymore because it's potentially painful. If we look at the elbow, the elbow is a joint unlike any we have seen thus far. Because in the elbow, the bone shape does have something to do with its stability. Your elbow is capable of flexion and extension, but no rotation. So far, we've seen with the arm and with the knee, there was a little bit of rotation ability with the knee, a lot of rotation ability with the shoulder. But here at the elbow, there is no rotation ability because the C-shaped structure of the ulna attaches to the humerus in such a way that it can flex and extend, but there is no left and right rotation ability. The bone interlocks. So in the elbow, bone shape is a significant factor in stability and in determining range of motion of that joint. We can see here a little bit of muscle associated with the joint, but not much. And again, that's just there to flex and extend, not necessarily to provide any great structural support. There are some ligaments here, and basically those ligaments are holding the humerus, ulna, and radius together so that they don't fall apart. We can see here the radial collateral ligament is going from the humerus to the radius or around the radius and down to the ulna. The annular ligament is holding the radius to the ulna. So when we pronated and supinated the lower arm, the radius was actually rolling back and forth underneath the annular ligament. But the ulna was not moving in that process. If we look at the inside view of the elbow there, we have ulnar collateral ligament on that side, uh, holding, again, humerus to ulna. So really only a handful of small ligaments here. Again, not structurally supporting, but simply holding bones together. So the elbow was primarily about bone shape. The hip is going to be similar to the shoulder in that it is a ball and socket joint. In this case, though, the head of the femur is a much larger ball. The acetabulum of the coxal bone is a much larger socket. So this ball and socket joint is much more dependent on bone shape than we saw with the shoulders. Not quite as much as with the elbow, but more so than most of the others. Again, this socket could always be better, so the acetabular labrum 
is just like we saw with the glenoid labrum and with the meniscus of the knee. It's deepening that socket a little bit to provide a better, deeper fit. Notice here the ligament of the head of the femur, the ligamentum teres. This is the only ligament preventing the head of the femur from leaving the socket of the hip. So really, this is what's preventing the femur from dislocating in this joint. And when we think about all the weight that the hips bear and all of the rotational forces that go through the hips, this ligament here really is quite sturdy to be able to hold the femur in that socket even though there are significant pressures trying to pop it out. In some of the follow-on videos that I will post after this one, you will see that um, there's a lot of range of motion capable at the hip. And some of you perhaps at some point in your life were capable of doing the splits. Now there are two different kinds of splits, the traditional splits out to the side, and then scissor splits, where one leg goes forward, the other leg goes back. And for those of you who could ever do the splits, and I was never in that category, just the thought of doing the splits causes me physical pain. And if I were to try to do that now, I would absolutely break in pieces. But for those of you who could do the splits, was it easier to do the side-to-side -side splits, or was it easier to do scissor splits? And I'm guessing that most of you would be answering the scissor splits would be easier. And this is biologically relevant because the hips are designed to allow legs to go forwards and backwards. They are not necessarily designed so much for legs moving out laterally in the side-to-side -side direction. So it's more of a natural movement front to back, and that simply requires take that normal range of motion and take it just a little farther, and then you get front or you get scissor splits. Traditional side-to-side -side splits requires a great deal of unnatural range of motion in the lateral side-to-side -side direction. So it's, it can be done, but it takes more stretching and more work. If we look here at some of the ligaments involved, again, it looks a lot like the shoulder. Mostly those ligaments are there to keep the femur from falling out but not necessarily stabilizing that joint so much. So we're going to say here that ligaments have minimal impact on stability of the joint. So we've got bone shape that is significant for the hip and also muscle that's going to be associated with it. You're going to have the gluteus maximus muscles associated with the femur and connecting to the hip. And you're going to have a bunch of other muscles connecting the femur and holding it in place on the hip. So bone shape and muscle is the primary stabilizing force of the hip ligaments again simply there to keep the femur to keep the leg from falling off here we have the temporomandibular joint or the tmj now sometimes you hear people say i have tmj <laughs> what they're technically saying is i have a temporomandibular joint I have a jaw that's attached to my skull. And what they were really talking about was they're talking about popping and discomfort and pain, maybe a little bit of dislocation in that joint. So they're really using the wrong term. What they really need to say is I have TMJ dislocation or I have TMJ pain and discomfort. But simply saying I have TMJ is a rather obvious statement because if you have a lower jaw, then yes, you have TMJ. But this is the most commonly dislocated joint in the body because if we look at what's holding it in place, the lateral ligament is preventing the jaw from falling off, sort of, but doesn't do a really great job of that. But if we look at this little socket here, it's a very shallow socket on the skull, very uh, relatively flattened head on the mandible so there's not a whole lot of bone shape there almost no bone shape there really very little in the way of ligaments as well so the primary thing holding the jaw together and controlling its function are the muscles of the face and primarily the masseter 
This is going to be the muscle that comes up on the back side of the mandible there, runs up to the uh, skull bones and holds it in place and allows you to depress and to uh, basically open and close the mouth, move the jaw. So this joint, again, very easily dislocates. And when you hear someone's jaw popping, what you're hearing is you're hearing this temporomandibular joint popping in and out of socket. For some people, that happens on a regular basis when they're chewing. So that just means your jaw is constantly dislocating and popping in and out. Because of that loose connection there, lateral excursion is possible. And that's when you would somewhat dislocate the lower jaw and move it left and right. And you can do that just by deciding you want to do that. And then it will probably pop back in place pretty easily. Occasionally when you go to the dentist, you will experience a more significant TMJ dislocation. So what can happen is with your mouth propped open at the right angle, it can pop out of that shallow socket at the back and actually slide forward. So protrude or protract the lower jaw such that the back of the mandible actually would pop up underneath the zygomatic bones of the skull. So up underneath your cheekbones. That would then lock your mouth in an opened position. And if this ever happens to you, no doubt you would freak out a little bit. And depending on how much experience the dental hygienist has, they may or may not freak out, but they will go get the doctor. And the doctor will say, okay, I'll be there in a minute. And that's probably not the response you're hoping for. You're probably hoping for the doctor to come rushing in, but really what they're going to do is grab that bottom jaw, pull it down out from underneath the cheekbones, put it back up a little bit, and then let go, and it will put itself back up in place. But that simply happens because that joint is so easily dislocated. Here's a torn meniscus. So this would have come from a knee. This actually came from Dr. Marib's knee, one of the two authors of your textbook. And she was playing tennis a number of years ago and sort of tore things a little. In tennis, you would lunge for a ball and then stop with that particular leg. The lower leg would plant on the ground, and the upper leg, as the laws of motion and physics would di dictate, tries to keep going. The idea is an object in motion wants to remain in motion. That's part of the laws of inertia. And so if the lower leg stops, the upper leg doesn't want to. And if it grinds on the meniscus the right way, you can see here that it just rips it off the tibia completely. So what we see over here on the side is meniscus that is intact, and it's somewhat attached, but over here in the middle, it's ripped off. So this gap here shouldn't be there. It should be attached there. And we can see here the meniscus itself is just kind of exploded. It's supposed to be nice and dense tissue like we see over here on this side, but here in the middle and on the other side, it's just blown to pieces. So they can go in and try to sew that back together and maybe staple it in place on the bone and try to hold it there. But probably forever afterwards, Dr. Marib has a little bit of tenderness and sensitivity in her knee, especially when the weather would change. Yet another reason to not play tennis. Let's say you need a joint replacement. So this is what a replacement part kit would look like for a hip. So if you're going to replace the hip, what you're going to do is cut off the top part of the femur. So you're cutting off the neck and head assembly of the femur and bolting on the new one you can see here. Nice little titanium stainless steel combination there probably. And bolt that in place on the femur. Then you're going to go up to the acetabulum of the hip. You're going to grind it out and you're going to insert this. So you have a new socket and a new ball. Once that's all bolted in place and everything's sewn up together, the femur attachment here will fuse with the rest of the bone over time, and you'll be off and walking the same day. So let's say your replacement surgery is finished by about noon, probably by about 4 o'clock that afternoon. A very sadistic nurse is going to be marching you up and down the halls. And what they discovered with joint replacements is the sooner you're up and moving and using them, the more successful the overall experience is. The better movement and motion you have from it, 
the less pain and discomfort you have, and overall, the more successful the whole process turns out to be. If you don't cooperate with the rehab, that joint can freeze up and be useless afterwards. Here's an x-ray image of a knee that's been replaced. So you can see what they did was they ground off the top of the tibia and bolted on a new top. So you can see the actual screws going in there and the shaft, in this case, going down inside the bone to provide greater stability. Up here on the femur, they ground out the inside of the femur here and bolted in a new condyle insert here. So just like we saw with the hip, we have new surface on the top, new surface on the bottom, and uh, then the bone fuses around it and away you go. With these procedures, they are generally expected to be good for about 30 years, which is a significant improvement upon what the old knee and joint replacement processes were. So the doctor will try to take into account the age of the patient and determine when it would be appropriate. And you want to make sure that you don't wear out a knee replacement by the time you're about 95, because at that age, that kind of surgery is a little bit uh, difficult for the body to endure. The rehab and recovery process on these is going to be about six months again and for the first couple of months after the surgery there might still be significant pain, definitely going to be significant swelling. Uh, for a knee replacement it's going to turn most of the leg black and blue even though the only slicing and dicing that occurred was in the knee region. And most of that's because they're going to do this entire surgery start to finish in about 30 minutes which is a lot of stuff going on in a short period of time. And really what that means is they're not being gentle, they're not being delicate, and they could be a lot more artistic with their approach. Unfortunately, many of those surgeons are interested in completing this one so they can get to the other five they have scheduled today. You know, I'm thinking if they would take an hour and a half to do this instead of 30 minutes, that they would be able to be more delicate and it wouldn't cause as much accessory tissue damage and swelling afterwards. But um, I suppose if I was in that position, I'd be looking for the next paycheck too. Now it is my personal recommendation that if both of your knees are worn out, get both of them replaced at the same time. And the reason for this is it's one surgery, one rehab period, and you come out balanced. What people often do if they have one knee done is they favor that knee, which in fact wears out the other one faster. So if you have them both done at the same time, you limp evenly, and you have, again, the one surgery, the one rehab, and you're done on both sides. Some doctors are reluctant to do that. It has nothing really to do with your body's ability to handle the surgery as much as it has to do with their ability to bill for it. Now, unfortunately, again, some doctors, or perhaps a lot of doctors, are motivated by the money thing. So it turns out that if they do one knee now and come back in a year or two and do the other one, they get to bill for two separate surgeries. If they do both knees in the same day, many insurance billings work that they cannot bill for two knees, but they only get to bill for one and a half knees because they did it as one total surgery. So they're basically taking a 25% reduction in fees if they do both knees at the same time. Now if you have that sort of problem and the doctor doesn't want to cooperate, I would propose there's more than one surgeon out there talk to a different doctor. Because biologically it seems to be better for the patient in terms of recovery and rehab and being balanced and overall function if both are done at the same time, if they're needed. If the other knee that you have is still good, obviously don't chop out a good piece because it's still good, but if both need to be done, it seems to be of benefit to get them both done at the same time. In your reading assignment, you will read about different kinds of arthritis. And arthritis is basically inflammation and swelling of joints. Uh, several different varieties of arthritis exist, and this is perhaps the worst form. This is rheumatoid arthritis, so we'll spend a moment talking about this. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. And what that means is that your own immune system attacks your own tissues when they shouldn't. Your immune system is supposed to recognize your tissue and say that belongs here and we're going to leave it alone. 
But with rheumatoid arthritis, for some reason, the immune system starts attacking the joints, tearing up those connective tissues between the bones, and it seems to start in the hands first, then go to the feet after that. And why that is, I don't know, but that's just the way it is. And what you see here, all that swelling around those joints, that's the immune system in there causing inflammation and causing permanent scar tissue accumulation. So this hand is turning into a claw. That hand is not going to be readily movable. There's going to be constant pain with it. So can you imagine what it would be like trying to button a shirt, zip a zipper, grip and turn a door handle, or try to hold a pin or a fork? Those are going to be things that are quite difficult to the point that they have designed special silverware that best fits in a hand like this so you don't have to grip that fork and knife so much. It's more like hanging on to a ball rather than hanging on to a slender piece of uh, eating accessories. I had a great aunt who had severe rheumatoid arthritis. Her hands looked much worse than this. She couldn't dress herself with anything that had buttons or zippers. Every door handle in the house had to be changed from a regular door handle to a lever door handle that you could simply push and then push on the door rather than have to grip and turn. And her husband had to cut up any of her food that needed to be cut up. So really she was quite dependent on her husband to do normal everyday things that you and I would think nothing of whatsoever because of this problem. We really don't know where it comes from and what causes it so much. And there's not a lot that we can do for it that doesn't cause other problems too. The primary treatment for rheumatoid arthritis and a number of other things now is basically immunosuppressant therapy. So give you a medication that will suppress your immune system. And what it does is it slows down the rate of damage, but it also leaves you susceptible to other illnesses because, again, your immune system is suppressed. So there's a trade-off there in terms of getting some help with this particular problem versus opening yourself up for other problems. So that's a fine balance there that one would want to be careful with when they make decisions about these treatments. Hopefully you learned a lot. And I will post a couple of other videos uh, from around YouTube about joints and what they also do will give you an idea of what is possible with joint movements. And while you're watching them, I want you to obviously enjoy them, but also ask yourself, based on what I know about joints, with the bone shape, with the ligaments, tendons, with the muscles, how are some of these things that I'm seeing even possible? And some of them will perhaps twist you up inside and ruin your day. And that makes me happy to think about how I can ruin your life with these sorts of things. And uh, so enjoy those. And by the time it's over, you will have a greater appreciation for joints. Have a wonderful day.